Okay, everybody, happy Friday to y'all. Got a few things at the top. Uh, first on uh, scheduling, a scheduling matter, and you'll see us, we'll, we'll put out a, a, uh, a note here shortly, but uh, I can announce that the secretary will be traveling to Zurich, Switzerland on the 20th of January, where he'll meet with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov to discuss Syria and Ukraine. I think we talked about this the other day. Uh, right on the heels of that, he will travel to Davos, Switzerland from the 21st to the 22nd to attend the World Economic Forum, and then from there to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where he will meet with senior Saudi Arabian leaders, uh, as well as foreign ministers of the Gulf Co Cooperation Council states to discuss a range of bilateral and regional issues. After that stop, he will go to the Asia-Pacific region, where he will visit uh, leaders in Laos, Cambodia, and China. Uh, again, uh, to reaffirm our, our uh, firm and strong commitment to the Asia-Pacific rebalance, to our interests in the region, and to discuss, as you might imagine, a whole host of bilateral uh, and regional issues with uh, those leaders. We very much look forward to, uh, to that trip. Um, what, right after Riyadh. Laos, Cambodia, Thank you. and uh, China. Um, on uh, on uh, Russia, as a follow-up to Secretary Kerry's December 15th meetings in Moscow with President Putin and with Foreign Minister Lavrov, Assistant Secretary for European and Eurasian Affairs Victoria Nuland, met today with Russian's, Russian presidential advisor Vladislav Surkov in Kaliningrad, Russia. Uh, and there they discussed the situation in eastern Ukraine and the need for full implementation of the Minsk agreements. The talks were constructive and designed to support the ongoing work of the Normandy countries and the trilateral contact group. On Somalia, the United States strongly condemns the Al-Shabaab terrorist attack today against Kenyan troops that were operating under the African Union mission in Somalia, AMISOM, as you guys know it, uh, and Somali National Army troops that were stationed in El Ade, the Guido region of Somalia. We extend our deepest condolences to the families uh, of all the soldiers killed, and of course we wish a speedy and quick recovery to those who were injured. The United States remains fully committed to providing assistance to the government of Kenya, the government of Somalia, and our Amazon and Amazon partners to combat terrorism, uh, violent extremism, and to enhance security within Somalia, Kenya, and the region. And uh, finally on Turkey, if I can keep this page from falling off. We've seen reports of Turkish academics being investigated and detained for expressing their opinions about the conflict in southeast Turkey. We see this action as part of a troubling trend in Turkey, whereby official bodies, law enforcement, and judicial authorities are being used to discourage legitimate political discourse. As our ambassador to Turkey, John Bass, has already stated in a, in, in a statement today, expressions of concern about violence do not e equal support for terrorism. Criticism of the government does not equal treason. Turkish democracy is strong enough and resilient enough to embrace free expression of uncomfortable ideas. As Turkey's friend and NATO ally, we urge Turkish authorities to ensure that their actions uphold the universal democratic values that are enshrined in their constitution, including freedom of expression. And with that, we'll go to questions. Arshad. We start with um, uh, the Secretary's current travel. Um, where is he now, and where might he be going next? <laughs> he remains in London, Arshad. I don't have any uh, updates uh, on his uh, on his follow-on travel. As soon as we do, um, uh, we'll certainly let you know. Is he staying? To, is he staying the night in London, or is it possible that he might fly home or go elsewhere today? Uh, again, I, I don't have any updates for his travel. I can tell you that he remains in London right now, um, and as soon as uh, we know what his follow-on uh, travel plans are, uh, we'll, we'll certainly keep you apprised. Okay, and then I'm sure you've seen uh, that there are reports that the IAEA's uh, JCPOA compliance report on or verification report on Iran is expected to be uh, released. Uh, tomorrow, um, that is Saturday, uh, in Vienna. Uh, can you confirm that? I cannot. I'd have to refer you to the IAEA. I've seen the same press reports, but I'm in no position to confirm uh, how, how uh, 
the status of the report and, and where it is and how far along it is. Okay, so to, to your knowledge, and I'm sure you saw what your colleague at the White House said, which made it sound like Iran has done uh, much, if not all, of what it needed to do. To your knowledge, has Iran uh, taken, even if it has yet to be verified by the IEA, has Iran taken all the steps that it needs to under the JCPOA for implementation to occur? As I understand it, they have uh, worked very, very hard at uh, uh, completing all their steps. I do not know, as you and I talk here right now, whether they have completed everything. And, um, and I do not know um, the status of the verification of the steps um, that they, they might have completed. Um, again, that's all for the IAEA to determine and then to issue their report, and I just don't have an update on the timing or the status of that. Could you travel? Yeah, sure. So, now, uh, he's in London. Would you say that the focus remains Syria for his presence in, in London? Is that would be, would that be the, the, the case? Well, I mean, the primary reason for going to London was to meet with the Foreign Minister uh, Al Jaber, and there's uh, lots of, I mean, there's lots of topics uh, that they that they discussed, uh, but obviously Syria was right at the top of that list in terms of the political process moving forward. Uh, but there's other issues. I mean, one of the reasons he wanted to meet with the Foreign Minister was also to discuss the, the recent tensions with Iran um, that you and I have all, we've all been talking about for the past week or so. Yeah, I understand, but the meeting is done. I mean, the meeting was yesterday. And I'm sure they discussed the, the situation between Iran and Saudi Arabia. But what is the reason for his continued presence uh, in London? Is it basically to, maybe to organize uh, the, 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 I, the, the process the forward for Syria? The Secretary has been very busy in London, even right. even after completion of his meeting with Foreign Minister Al um, uh, speaking uh, on numerous times with various uh, leaders around the world mm -hmm. uh, about lots of topics going on around the world, right. not the least of which is, um, uh, you know, is continued progress towards um, uh, implementation of the Iran deal. So, I mean, there's been plenty of work for him to do in London, and I just don't have anything to report in terms of uh, any follow-on travel. Right. Yeah. Sorry, Said, you weren't done? I'll follow up on Okay, I just wanted, you said yesterday that the uh, administration would be ready to go with sanctions relief once the announcement was made, but can you tell us uh, of Implementation Day, I mean, what, what, what is, what's going to happen when Implementation Day happens, the sanctions, will there be an announcement that they're lifted, and will there be some kind of guidance issued to businesses right away, or how, how what's going to, what can we expect I, to I'm happen? I'm not entirely clear what the mechanics of it is, but clearly w once we get to implementation, there'll be an official uh, announcement about that. Um, and uh, we'll do what we need to do uh, here in the United States to make the proper notifications. I don't know what the mechanics of that look like. I mean, we can try to get you uh, one of our experts to kind of walk you through that. I, I just don't have that level of detail. But yes, the, our major requirement on implementation day is sanctions relief. John, is there a concern that the efforts to get to implementation day might be rushed, that the IAEA may not have enough time to do all of the double checking that it needs to do in order to make certain that Iran is complying with the terms of the JCPOA? No, there's no rush here. There's there's, there's no rush, and, and the IAEA is an independent agency, as you know, and um, they, they can't be rushed, and they shouldn't be rushed. And uh, the reason why we believe we're very close to implementation day is because Iran um, has put a great deal of effort um, in uh, – in trying to meet all their commitments. Um, and that's the only thing driving the schedule. We've said all along that there will be no implementation day, there will be no sanctions relief uh, until they've met all their requirements, their commitments under the JCPOA, and the IAE can verify that they have done so. Uh, we're not there right now, um, uh, and uh, I can tell you that the process continues, but that's the only thing driving uh, any sense of timing. There's. There's no artificial pressure being applied. There's no, there's no rush afoot here. And in terms of the, the domestic political climate here in the United States, what is this administration prepared to do to try to quiet the naysayers once the IAEA comes out and says Iran has complied with the terms of the JCPOA? <laughs> that question uh, would presuppose that you can quiet uh, uh, critics. And, and uh, look, we've said all along that we know that there, there have been and the, there are and there will continue to be critics of 
of this deal, um, whether they're um, in the halls of Congress or elsewhere, even around the world. Mm -hmm. And what we've said all along is that uh, uh, we're going to continue to engage in dialogue and discussion and uh, and uh, and talk about this and answer whatever questions that we can. We've been very open and transparent about that in multiple uh, discussions with members of Congress, uh, uh, even in uh, you know an open testimony. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't speak for the critics and what they'll say uh, when we get to implementation or how they'll react. That's that's for them to speak to. What I can tell you is that we're going to continue to work uh, towards making sure that we're all ready to meet our commitments. Mm -hmm. Iran has continued to take it, the steps that it needs to take to implementation. Again, we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, and, but once we get there, and we will to, to, our, to implementation day, uh, you know, then we'll, the, the deal will be in effect. And, you know, let's not forget that, uh, that upon implementation, uh, we will have, through the deal, Mm -hmm. as long, and through a very rigorous verification and inspection regime going forward, mm -hmm. uh, been able to make sure that Iran uh, does not possess or acquire uh, uh, nuclear arms. Um, but, and again, I'd say it again, that a, a Middle East, which is already uh, under great tension, mm -hmm. without a nuclear armed Iran is, is better than one with it. But it's not just quieting the critics. The critics uh, in large part belong to a co-equal branch of the U.S. government, and they can try to pass legislation to basically undermine the yeah. terms of the JCPOA, and especially the sanctions relief. It, it's what's, not about what's, what's, what, is the U, what is the administration prepared to do to essentially prevent them from doing something that we can all pretty much assume they're going to do? It's not about try quieting critics. That, that, uh, we've there have been critics all along, and there will continue to be, and that that's okay. Everybody's entitled to a different view. It's about continuing to ad address the concerns. Mm -hmm. um, but once the deal is implemented, the deal is implemented. Now, I can't speak hypothetically to what measures uh, you know, the, the members of Congress might pursue uh, after that. We'll have to they, – they can speak to that, and, um, and we'll, you know, we'll, you know, we'll have to address it if and when that, that happens, but um, upon implementation deal, sanctions relief occurs, mm -hmm. and the deal is in effect. Um, and again, most importantly, uh, Iran is prevented from ever acquiring nuclear arms and those capabilities. On that point, uh, uh, John. Now, uh, what Iran needs to do is are measurable, tangible things, right? Would you say that they covered 50 percent, 70 percent of of, of what they needed to do, for instance, turn over their enriched uranium, pouring cement in the core, and so on, and all these things that they have done. So, how how many more steps, or what are the remaining steps? I mean, I'm not, not going to uh, th that abstract. Is, uh, the, I'm not going to get ahead of the work the IAE is doing. But as you heard the secretary say, we you know they are shipping out all that uh, mm -hmm. low enriched uranium. They we you know that was a key component. Uh, one of the things they needed to do, and it. Obviously, it, it advanced the breakout time from a matter of months to more than a year, just in that one, in, in that, um, you know, in that one movement. But um, in general, I can get, I can walk you through what their steps are. Okay. Um, I won't talk to you about progress on that. That is not my responsibility. That's the IAEA. But mm -hmm. they have to modify and redesign the Iraq plutonium reactor so that it cannot be used again to produce weapons-grade plutonium. They have to disconnect and remove two-thirds of uh, their installed centrifuge capacity, going from over 19,000 uh, to, to just over 5,000. Um, they have to reduce their stockpile of, of up to 5 percent low enriched uranium from the current stockpile uh, down to 300 kilograms or less. We've talked about that. Um, they have to disconnect all uranium enriching, enriching centrifuges at, at Fort Al and turn the facility into a research facility that will no longer be enriching uranium. They have to put in place all the transparency measures with the IAEA specified in the JCPOA, uh, including 24-7 uh, monitoring of all Iran's declared nuclear facilities. Uh, and they have to provisionally apply the IAEA additional protocol and implement modified code 3.1, which if you look in the deal, we'll have more detail on that. So all that's very public. That's, that's all in the, um, in the documents, which you, you can find online. 
Uh, I won't, again, give them a report card on all those things. That's not our job. That's, the, that's for the agency to do. You said yesterday that there had to be some other, I guess, paperwork that needed to be done once the IAEA comes out with its report on the part of the P5 plus one. Can you spell out exactly what documents need to be signed, how they can be done? Are you I don't have that level of detail. As I said to, to Arshad's question, there's sort of two things here. They're, they have to complete all their steps, mm -hmm. and, then, and then their steps have to be verified by the IAEA. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about right. the documentation. I just simply don't have uh, a status report for you on all that. U.S. relations with Iran may get a whole lot more challenging after uh, they have taken the nuclear steps and uh, you and the European Union and the United Nations have uh, taken the sanctions easing steps? Well, I mean, to be clear, the, the Iran deal was never about defining in, or improving our, uh, a relationship with Iran. Um, it was about cutting off their pathways to a nuclear bomb, and it will do that. Um, so nobody's looking at this um, from a relationship perspective. That's, that's not the purpose of it. What we've always said, that, it, that if as a by byproduct of the deal and the dialogue that the deal engendered, uh, Iran were to be willing to change its behavior in the region and its conduct and become a responsible member of the international community, well, that would be, a, that, that would be welcomed. Uh, but that onus is on Iran and, and only Iran. Uh, we don't have diplomatic relations with that country. I, 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 uh, I, I see no prospect for that uh, any time in the, in the near future. I'm not trying to predict one way or the other, but there are no diplomatic relations with Iran. And, um, and we're not talking about that at this time. We're talking about making sure they can't become a nuclear armed state. Well, I guess the reason I'm asking the question is that up until implementation day, all of your sanctions remain in place. On implementation day, some of your sanctions go away. Mm -hmm. And they're quite significant, the ones that go away, notably on those that had previously barred non-U.S. actors from mm -hmm. buying other than constrained amounts of Iranian oil. And so the, the thing I wonder is whether the administration thinks that as a result of this deal, it's going to end up with a kind of cooperative Iran, like the one that released the sailors within 24 hours of taking them into custody, or to the contrary, whether it thinks it's going to face an Iran that is uh, more pugnacious and engages in more of the kinds of behaviors that you don't like because they will have gotten much of what they wanted out of you, which is sanctions relief, right? So are you bracing for a tougher Iran or are you hoping or thinking that it's actually going to get better? We're pretty clear eyed, I think, about uh, Iran and uh, their capacity for misbehavior. Nobody's making any. Uh, predictions one way or another how uh, what the future will hold in terms of uh, in terms of that behavior but I can tell you that again this was solely focused on on uh, removing uh, uh, nuclear arms from their capabilities and and not about uh, changing their behavior which is why we will still have at our disposal at our disposal sorry uh, unilateral um, and the international community will have multilateral mechanisms and tools, including sanctions, to deal with um, the fact that they will still, on implementation day, be a state sponsor of terror. That on implementation day, they still will remain uh, a threat to uh, others in the region, um, to include Israel. That, uh, that on implementation day, um, they will still, uh, or, you know, we, we have to assume will still uh, be uh, supporting groups like Hezbollah. So uh, nobody's, uh, again, I've said this before, uh, nobody's turning a blind eye to the, to the, to the fact that uh, this, this is still a regime that, that bears significant watching. Um, and, and this isn't about trust. It's not about uh, uh, trying to forge a new friendship here. It, it's, about, it's about taking a very big step to try to reduce 
in the in in the realm of nuclear arms, uh, their ability uh, to do that much more harm uh, to people in the region. And just one other one for me on this: Did you get an answer to the question that I, uh, I think you had said you would take on uh, whether you, whether L regards the Geneva Conventions and as as applying to the U.S. soldiers that were in the U.S. sailors, excuse me, that were in Iranian custody? Yeah, I, I, my what my comments yesterday still stand. So, in other words, you're not at war, therefore they're not prisoners it's, of war, therefore the we're not, we're not in an armed conflict uh, with Iran, and there's been no legal determination to that effect. So my comments still stand. Okay. Change of thought. Yeah. Sorry, no, same topic. Uh, two, two questions. One technical question uh, regarding the implementation day. Who will be giving the green light? Who will be saying uh, to more in the coming days, this is it, the deal is uh, implemented? Well, the IAEA has to make the certification, the validation, um, and then the P5 plus one, uh, you know, will come on top of that and so state. Um, and then and, and we'll, for, as a member of that group, we'll make our own official announcement and statement that from the United States perspective, we're in effect. So there'll be a series of statements, but it all has to start with the IAEA and, and their certification. Who would make government that it is in effect? Would it be the State Department? Would it be the White House? Would it be the Treasury I, I don't want to get ahead of the, 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 the specifics of the process. I, 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 uh, I just would tell you that the U.S. would, you know, would, as you would expect we would, as we did in the past, you know, would, would issue the appropriate statements at the appropriate time um, to indicate that, you know, that it's in effect for us as well. Do you expect the IAEA to say publicly, we have a certification ready, or does that happen when the P5 plus 1 seen it? I, I don't have that level of detail, Dave. I, I don't, I, I'd have to refer you to the IAEA. I mean, I, I can only really speak for, for our piece of this. And a broader question uh, regarding your policy with, with Iran. What, what do you respond to your uh, historicalized Saudi Arabia and Israel uh, that are scared that that the U.S. is is moving toward Iran is doing this is that this nuclear deal is only the start of a rapprochement between the U.S. and Iran, and that there will be a major shift in the region. I, I'd ask them to read the transcript of my answer to Arshad just a few minutes ago, and this deal was about one thing and one thing only: removing Iran's ability to possess nuclear weapons, and it will do that. And one of the reasons why we push so hard for the deal, why it matters so much to us, is because it is so good for our allies and partners and friends in the region. It makes them all safer. And Iran without that capability is not just good for our interest, it's good for their interest. That's what we would say. Yes. Uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. India, two questions, please. Uh, one starting with the, as far as failure of the talks between the two countries, uh, India and Pakistan, always uh, innocent people are the victims so in both sides. And when whenever they want to start people to people talk, the people can benefit and development can go on between in two countries. But there are some always elements at the last minute, all these bombings and happens. My question is here that people are asking now from both sides that. Uh, Whenever bombing happens in India or Pakistan, only the innocent people are the victims there. So where, what is the message now? Because this is the history now. Whenever they come very close to have talks, dialogue, and uh, meeting at the highest level, and then these things happen, so bombings and all that, then because uh, some elements, as I said, that wants to, or they are against the talks and two countries to come closer. Well, we want, as I said before, we want them to continue to, to to have a dialogue and to continue to look for ways to cooperate against a common threat. Um, and we talked about this not long ago in a recent conversation between both Prime Ministers Sharif and Modi. We, that was a welcome sign, both condemning the, the uh, terrorist attack on the, on the air station and expressing their shared commitment uh, to fighting terrorism. That was not an insignificant discussion that they had, nor was it an insignificant commitment that they made. And it's exactly the kind of commitment that we want them to continue to make. Um, it should come as a shock to no one that terrorist groups will try to undermine those sorts of efforts by conducting uh, spectacular attacks, to, to do exactly that, to sow fear, um, and to hopefully sow doubt in the minds of 
national leaders uh, towards a level of cooperation that can have a real a practical effect. And obviously, we don't want to see that happen. And we're, we're we are encouraged by the the, the dialogue that has uh, recently taken place between India and Pakistan, and we'd like to see that continue. And totally. second, uh, if, as far as the U.S.-India relations are concerned, Ambassador Richard Verma, I believe that he's having a fun and a wonderful time in India as um, U.S. ambassador. He started his new year with a long uh, year and message to the people of India from the people of the uh, U.S., of course, um, you must have seen, where he laid down all the U.S.-India relations took place between Prime Minister Modi and, um, of course, President Obama and Secretary Kerry and uh, Foreign Minister Shusma, among other leaders and um, talks and uh, visits and all that, where he said that progress has been done in this year of 2015 and we have a long way to go and much has been uh, done and but much to be done. So where we go from here now, and now Railway Minister of India is here in town and meeting and greeting all the high-level U.S. officials as far as infrastructure and uh, uh, railways and transportation in India, including today meeting the Transportation Secretary, and yesterday he was at the Carnegie. So where do we go now? What is much, much to be done? Well, you've said it yourself. There is, there's still much to be done. And again, this is an important relationship that we want to continue to improve. Um, uh, and uh, we have excellent uh, relations uh, with the government of India. We want to make them even better. And I think you can, um, again, I point you to the am ambassador's uh, end of year uh, statement, which I think was pretty complete, pretty comprehensive. Uh, we know uh, how important this relationship is, and I can assure uh, you and the Indian people that the United States remains committed to it. But John, one thing is there that for the last 10 years, people of India and the U.S. industries are waiting for this civil nuclear agreement, which is already done, everything is done. But where are we now where the people of India are asking when they will get all these trucks moving to India for this uh, uh, electricity and all the developments uh, that they're waiting for? I just don't have an update for you on that specific. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Totally. I'm shocked. You, you, yeah. <laughs> you read at the time. Have you raised this concern with the Turkish government, first of all? I think you saw uh, Ambassador Bass tweeted on this, but uh, it which was, was a public pretty statement. clear, pretty concise, and pretty public. Yes, of course, we always raise these issues with Turkish authorities, what publicly and privately. Because he was blamed to be um, kind of enemy of the Turkish US relations when he tweeted on this. Mayor of the Ankara said that he's hurting the relations between the two. Uh, so I'm wondering, of course, he's not a part of the government, but I'm wondering if you with the same reaction for the government as well. Do I have the same reaction? Like the Ankara mayor said. Do you believe that? What I can tell you is that Turkey has no better friend than the United States, and they certainly have, and, and, and that's certainly represented in, in Ambassador Bass. Uh, nobody is more committed to seeing Turkey succeed and to live up to its own constitution and democratic values. Uh, nobody's more committed to that than Ambassador Bass. Um, and it's because he deeply cares about the Turkish people and the health of the Turkish democracy that he spoke the way he did, that he issued the statement of concern that he did. It wasn't a it wasn't picking sides on the on the academics' arguments or not. That wasn't the issue. In fact, you can look at his statement and he makes that clear. It was the idea of being able to express opinions freely and openly and to challenge uh, to challenge government in a peaceful, uh, democratic way, which is enshrined in the Turkish constitution itself. So. Uh, to the mayor of Ankara, and I've seen those comments, I would say uh, that Turkey has no better friend than Ambassador Bass, and, and that's very much represented uh, in, in his statement. Did you see the same reaction from the government? I, I've only seen the press reports from the, the same ones that you're alluding to. And have you discussed this issue with the government on the I've reaction? I've answered that question already. Of course, we raise these issues all no, the time. the reaction of the reports. mayor. I mean, because I, I don't have an update for you. Uh, it, it, the article just appeared a little bit ago. I've seen it same time as you have. Okay. And uh, uh, can I finish it? And uh, you said the troubling uh, trend. Are you concerned about the direction of Turkey in general? I, I think I'm going to leave it at my opening statement. It's a troubling trend that we're concerned about. 
and the last one. Uh, I'm, I know that you're cautious about not to interfere with the domestic policy issue with other countries. And uh, the government circles, some pro-government circles, let's say, uh, criticize the uh, Ambassador Bass comments to interfere with the domestic policy of Turkey. Why you think that this is not an internal issue for Turkey? And why you uh, make the statement at the top? We are un uniformly and always expressly concerned about freedom of expression uh, around the world. And I, I can't tell you how many times in just the eight months I've been at the State Department that I've stood up here and I've talked about our concerns with respect to freedom of expression and freedom of the press uh, from this very podium about places all over the world. Um, it's, it's, it's one of our core values and it's, it's, it's one of our key principles uh, here in the United States. It matters deeply to us. And we know that it matters deeply to the Turkish people because it's in their constitution. And so when we see express examples where, uh, where those values are not being lived up to, values that, again, is enshrined in their own constitution, we believe we have an obligation to speak up about it. And we're going to continue to do that. Do you believe that these detentions are hurting the U.S.-Turkish relations? There, Turkey's a, a NATO ally, a strong partner and a friend. And I've said this before, uh, even allies and friends aren't always going to see eye to eye on everything. And good friends and allies, if you are a good friend and ally, should be able to discuss freely the concerns that you have with one another. And we do that with Turkey. We're not always going to see everything the, the same way that they do. But it doesn't mean that the partnership is weaker. It doesn't mean that, that we're not as strong an ally. Uh, it means that it's a healthy relationship. That uh, that you can speak freely and uh, and express and express those same concerns, uh, and and uh, we're going to continue to do that when and where we see it it's appropriate. Okay. Sure. Yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, while you are uh, talking about concerns, uh, right now dozens of academicians who signed that petition uh, detained. Uh, some of them already fired and suspended. Uh, so when we uh, report about your concerns, usually the uh, uh, echo comes from Turkey is that these concerns have been displayed for a long time, but the trend is continuous. Do, do you think these concerns that you have been expressing uh, make any difference? If no, then uh, what does it good for uh, uh, this expressing concerns as long as this witch hunt uh, is uh, going on in Turkey? Are you suggesting that we shouldn't speak up and, and uh, express the concerns when we have them? I think many people uh, think that the uh, U.S. Uh, should make uh, necessary policy changes as many think this building has enough able diplomats to uh, propose uh, such policy recommendations. We want to see Turkey, uh, as I said before, live up to its own democratic values. Ultimately, these are decisions that Turkish leaders have to make. These are sovereign decisions that they have to make. Uh, uh, that's what we want to see. And that's why we express our concerns in real time when they happen. We do that privately and we do it publicly, and we're going to continue to do that. But ultimately, we want to see Turkish leaders make the right decisions here and move in the right direction. I won't go beyond my opening statement in terms of characterizing uh, a trend or not. I said, we, it be, you know, we're, we call it a troubling trend, and, and, that's, and that's where I'll leave it. Uh, but we, we want to see uh, uh, those principles enshrined in the Turkish Constitution um, to be valued and to be, uh, and to be uh, implemented. You, in the same opening statement, uh, you said that Turkish democracy is strong enough to embrace uh, this freedom of expression. Can you? Tell us, what aspect of Turkish democracy you see strong uh, nowadays? I, I, it, was a, it was a broad statement that I stand by. We believe that it is a, a strong enough, resilient enough democracy. We believe the Turkish people are strong enough and resilient enough uh, to live up to these values, and that's what we want to see them do. And finally, today, one of the uh, oldest mainstream newspaper, Cumhuriyet newspaper, uh, it's reported uh, by the uh, censorship watchdog that uh, has been selectively blocked by some of the country's largest uh, s service providers. The day after President Erdogan fiercely attacked the newspaper, 
headline uh, came yesterday. Uh, do you have any comment on this particular? Uh, I haven't seen that report, uh, but obviously, if it's true, uh, everything that I mentioned in the last few minutes and in my opening statement would would still stand. Uh, we want to see uh, Turkey live up to its democratic values, and that includes freedom of expression and freedom of the press. And we've been nothing but consistent about that particular matter over these many months. But I haven't seen that report. Yeah. Yes. Um, when Secretary uh, Kerry goes to China, will he, besides DPRK, will he be? discussing the Taiwan's presidential election uh, with their Chinese counterpart? Well, I think there will, he'll be discussing a wide range of, of bilateral issues that, uh, uh, that, we, uh, that we routinely discuss with China. I, I'm not going to get ahead of specific agenda items. I do know that uh, Deputy Secretary Blinken will be meeting with the, uh, the uh, Zhang Zhijun, who is uh, the official in charge of the Taiwanese affairs in, in the Chinese government. Is there a nuance that um, for for Secretary Kerry not to discuss a Taiwan issue with his counterpart because uh, I, I didn't say that he wasn't going to discuss Taiwan. I said I'm not going to get a whole head of specific agenda items. Uh, uh, cross strait relations is obviously something that we routinely discuss with uh, with Chinese leaders. Uh, there's a lot of other things as well uh, on the agenda. There's, I mean that that you would expect that they would discuss. But again, I'm not going to get into uh, specific items right now. Or and, and when. The meetings are over, and when we can read them out to you, then then we'll have those discussions. If he, indeed he he meet with the, he discuss the Taiwan issue, can we read that the stuff is not a discussion of sovereignty, or is that any nuance? On I, I, I can appreciate your strong desire for nuance before we've even left Andrews Air Force Base. I, I I'm just simply not going to get ahead of uh, of the specific discussions that we're we're going to have. Uh, you can imagine that. Uh, that because the U.S.-China relationship is so important to them and to us, because there's so much change uh, in the region um, and tension, that there are a lot of issues uh, that he will be raising with his Chinese counterparts. Uh, and, I mean, uh, again, I don't want to go through a, a list of them. I think you, you can imagine what, you know, what they would be, everything from um, security challenges uh, to, to economic opportunity, okay? Can we move on to Macedonia? Macedonia? You're going all the way from China to Macedonia, okay. Huh? Yeah. Um, so with the death of former comfort woman Cheng Chen Tao earlier this week, uh, President Ma of Taiwan, he said that he would continue to work on achieving just justice for Taiwanese women. Um, would you support such efforts? of reconciliation on this issue between Taiwan and Japan? I, I, I'm afraid I don't have a comment for you on that. I haven't seen those comments. Quickly related question about the uh, Secretary Japan or South Korea? No, as I told you, uh, stopping in Laos, Cambodia, That's and it. Beijing. No, no other. There's not a stop in Japan on this trip. Huh? ISIS? What about ISIS? I have a couple questions on the flight. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just. No, we're going just to trying, I am. I am, uh, yeah. I am just trying to keep up with you guys today. Uh, tip, you know, when I first took this job, it was no, no, Kirby. We're going to stay on topic, we're stay on and topic. we're going to exhaust the topic before we go to the next one, exactly. um, which is not the way we did it at the Pentagon. And uh, okay. this is actually more like what I'm used to. But it's okay. just you guys are flipping on me here. All right, what, <laughs> let's go to let's go to Macedonia so that so that. We <laughs> okay, do you have any comment on the uh, newest announcement from the Prime Minister that he's planning to reside? Do you think this is a sign of uh, implementation of the Prisno agreement? Uh, it's deal? part of the, it's part, his resignation is, is part of that agreement. So you welcome It's an that? intrinsic part of it. Um, we continue to support Macedonia efforts uh, towards deepening their Euro-Atlantic integration. We support uh, the Perzino Agreement as an essential next step towards that goal, and we're working with the EU to assist Macedonia's leaders to build on the progress and implementation they've made so far. The Prime Minister's res resignation was a part of the agreement, uh, and I'd refer you to the government of Macedonia for any further information about it. Is the U.S. playing any role as a facilitator because uh, uh, a few days ago I remember the Prime Minister met with the uh, Vice President Joe Biden in Washington. 
Yeah, you're right. The, the vice president met on the 11th. Um, they agreed on the importance of continued implementation of the agreement and taking the ap actions necessary to ensure credible elections. And the vice president emphasized the United States' continued support, again, for Macedonia's EU, uh, Atlant I'm sorry, Euro-Atlantic integration. So would you call the U.S. as a facilitator to that process? I did not say that. I, I, I told you we support their, their integration, uh, their Euro-Atlantic uh, integration. And uh, can I have one quick question on Ukraine on the following up? Sorry. Final <laughs> You guys got to please yourselves, you know? Um, the Ukraine, uh, the meeting to take place in Russia. Why is that? Is that because of the uh, Putin's aid is under the Western sanction not to travel to? Uh, the, the location uh, for the meeting was, uh, was established by, by the Russian government. Uh, we didn't, uh, that was their choice to meet in Kaliningrad. And then the U.S. did not ask them, him to come over here? Or? The, deci the decision to meet there was a, a Russian decision. But then the fact, because he's under sanction not to travel, does, is that in any way undermine the Western sanction for his travel due to the undermining the suffering Not at all. Uh, there's no prohibition on meeting with an individual who's under sanctions. Uh, he, uh, he is the ap appropriate person in their government to have these discussions about Minsk implementation, um, and he was chosen by the Russian government uh, to head these meetings, and, and so we attended the meetings, and, and we had uh, good discussions today. Yes? Yes, yes. Yes, I just, yesterday, uh, Steve Warren from Baghdad uh, you know, talked about uh, the, the, the way or, uh, in which the United States or the coalition is fighting ISIS, but he also mentioned that there are 6,000 troops, 3,500 3, are Americans and 2,500 others from other countries. What other countries? have uh, troops or soldiers in, in the fight against ISIS in Iraq? You'd have to go to the Defense Department and so say, I don't have the breakdown. There's some mm. 65 nations in the coalition. Not all mm. of them, of course, have yeah, troops well, inside uh, Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, but I'd I, I, I point you back to Steve for well, a breakdown. Do, do, of they, do they include I don't any, any troops, let's say, from the Arab countries, Jordan, Saudi Arabia? I, I like don't that? have a breakdown, so okay, and, and I have uh, one other question on the same issue. Uh, there are also, well, I mean, it's been reported by the Pentagon that about 100 uh, special forces units will be deployed in Syria and in Iraq to conduct special operations and so on. Will they be like separate units working uh, on their own sort of against high-value targets, or will they be working with the current president uh, for American force? I'm not going to talk about military matters. The only thing I'd say is I, I think uh, uh, the Pentagon's been clear that, uh, that the primary focus of this is an advise and assist, um, mm -hmm. and that if there's a need for them to be directly involved in, in, a, in a raid, uh, that they can do that. But beyond that, I simply am not qualified to speak to it. You really should uh, go to the Defense Department for that. Yes. Go back to you, Ron. Sure. Um, just about the political climate around the implementation. Technically, obviously, the requirements for the U.S. are clear, um, but there's political opposition, and Mr. Obama is going to keep vetoing uh, legislation that he feels is not helpful till he leaves, but he's only here for another year. And I'm just wondering if that political uncertainty could um, affect the perception of success, because, you know, bankers might be very cautious and so on. Is there any concern? that even though technically you'll do what you need to do, uh, politically it will look like you're, or practically it will look like things aren't well, happening are, and this might affect the success of the implementation? Well, those are decisions that, you know, business leaders will have to make. I mean, our concern is, uh, is getting the deal in effect, make, ensure that we do our part, which is the sanctions relief, uh, that uh, is part of that deal, uh, but these are ultimately corporate decisions that, that, that need to be made and, uh, and they'll have to speak to the calculus with which, you know, they make those decisions. Yeah. Uh, Syria, um, uh, the Russian Defense Ministry has said that it has a new objective in Syria, and that is to deliver humanitarian aid to people in need. Do you see that report? Um, to your knowledge, have the Russians been delivering such aid? Do you welcome it? And if they are delivering such aid, are they delivering it to non-government controlled areas? Okay, let me see if I remember all those. I have not seen the report. Uh, I, I can tell you, though, that um, if you just give me a second to find it in this mammoth beast of a book I have here. Um, so let me, 
Let me talk a little bit about humanitarian aid, uh, Arshad, and then remind me about what I'm missing here uh, for you. But yesterday, a second joint UN-ICRC-Syrian-Arab-Red Crescent humanitarian convoy of over 60 aid trucks reached the towns of Madaya, Afua, and Kafraya, uh, where staff immediately distributed flour, winter clothes, blankets, and specialized health and nutrition supplies, medical personnel and nutritionists are accompanying the convoy to Madaya to examine patients, determine the criticality of health conditions, and provide uh, on-site medical uh, treatment as needed. Um, UNICEF has now publicly confirmed cases of severe malnutrition uh, were found among children in Madaya um, and uh, tragically announced uh, uh, that their staff was there to witness the, the death of a severely m malnourished 16-year-old boy uh, who passed away right in front of their eyes. The UN is working to get medical teams and mobile clinics to enter besieged areas immediately, uh, but it is still waiting on the Assad regime. So while we're relieved uh, about the arrival of additional assistance, uh, this suffering, this obstruction of humanitarian access should never have happened in the first place, um, and the overdue aid that's finally reached places like Madaya uh, is still not going to be enough. Well, what uh, Syrians need is immediate, unimpeded humanitarian access, consistent uh, and recurring. I have not seen anything that would uh, – <coughs> I've seen no indications that the Russian defense forces are involved in this uh, delivery. As I as I read in, uh, at the top, it's, it's UN and uh, it's, it's non-governmental agencies that are doing it, the ICRC. Um, that's not to say that uh, they have they, – they, they might have plans. They they, they could. Um, I I don't think that we would uh, we would certainly take a dim view if the Russian uh, defense ministry was more focused on providing humanitarian aid and assistance and less focused on bombing opposition groups and innocent civilians. So uh, if it, if it were true, huh? I said we wouldn't take a dim no, view if they were more focused view, yes. on. I hope I, hopefully I said that right. We'll have to look at the transcript. <laughs> we would not take a dim view if they focused more on humanitarian assistance and less on bombing opposition groups. But I have not seen anything to confirm that, A, they've made that policy decision, uh, or, B, that they've begun to implement it. Okay. Good. Uh, it, I got one more. Yes, sir. Um, uh, you may not have seen this in time to get an answer for the briefing, but it – the former um, – uh, chairman of uh, Mexico's ruling Institutional Revolutionary Party uh, has been arrested in Spain. Um, do you know if the U.S. government played any role whatsoever in his arrest? You're right. I don't have anything on that. I'm going to have to take that one for Thank you. Uh, I did not get uh, any updates like that before I came out here today. Can you just go to Nigeria then? Sure. There have been reports, including by my own agency, of uh, large-scale killings by Nigerian security forces in the town of Zaria in the north. They're conducting in a security operation against a Shiite group uh, led by Sheikh Zagzaki, the uh, Islamic movement in Nigeria, I believe. Uh, we, uh, our own sources are talking about a death toll of maybe 300, and there have been reports of up to 700 dead. Um, this is not Boko Haram, but this is another action by the by the, the Nigerian security forces. Is the United States aware of this? Do you have any comments? Yeah, we are. We continue to be very concerned uh, by these violent clashes between members of the uh, Nigerian army uh, and a Shiite group in the Kaduna state. In the days after these incidents, in both public and private statements, we called on the government of Nigeria to transparently investigate these reports and to hold accountable any individuals found to have committed abuses. We're aware of at least four separate investigations that are being carried out by the Nigerian Senate, House of Representatives, the National Human Rights Commission, and the Judicial, and the Judicial Commission of Inquiry established by, Kaduna State, uh, by the Kaduna State uh, Governor. We urge the individuals carrying out these investigations to carry them out swiftly, thoroughly, uh, and with, in, with impartiality. We have time for just a couple more. Yes, ma'am. Where? Working on the Asia, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB. Yeah. Um, so the AIIB will be officially launched tomorrow. Can I have your reaction to that? Is this the United States welcome it? Why don't you let me get a get get something back to you uh, on that? Okay. Uh, uh, when the Chinese President Xi was here, uh, he uh, he visited the uh, United States last September. He invited the United States to join the AIIB. 
just a two size discuss this issue. I'll get, I'll, let me get you. Let me get you a comment back on that. Okay. Or can you share your current status? I, I will get you. Uh, I'll get you an answer to your question later. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Last one. Um, this may be better directed to the Pentagon, but there were reports today saying that uh, North Korea would stop nuclear tests if the U.S. suspends joint military drills with South Korea and other countries. Do you have? I haven't seen those comments, but uh, look, we have a uh, uh, we have significant alliance commitments uh, with the Republic of Korea that we, that we take very very seriously, and we're going to continue to make sure that the alliance is. Uh, ready in all respects uh, uh, to uh, act in defense of uh, uh, the South Korean people and the security of the peninsula. Thanks, everybody.